Good evening. How are y'all doing? Welcome to Oak Grove tonight. Um, my name is Crystal Bambro. For those who do not know, I am Pastor Chris's wife, but he is still feeling under the weather, so he's at home. Hey, sweetie. But um, <laughs> he did want me to just share a couple of things on his behalf. And um, with this being our final night of revival, and it's been such a great week, and there's been a lot of people and prayer and just a lot that's gone into it. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I just want to take a minute and thank all of those, um, the pastors and the ministers. That's part of our ministerial alliance. They have done a fantastic job of planning this and putting it together. All of the um, musicians and the singers, we appreciate y'all coming and um, leading us into the presence of the Lord. Um, our media ministry team, we want to give a shout out to them. They have kept the sound going, the screen, and our live stream as well. And um, we also have a security team that kind of looks everything on the grounds, make sure everything's okay. And we want to thank the ushers. But we also want to thank you guys for coming out and supporting. We appreciate it. And most of all, we want to thank the Lord for coming and being part and Amen. pouring his Holy Amen. Spirit down in the way that he has. And so we're going to just head right into having church tonight. Amen. Well, let's stand together and worship the Lord. The Bible said, I was glad when they said unto me. Anybody else read the rest of that scripture before? Let us go to the house of the Lord. So you're glad you're able to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. All right. This is an, uh, yes, let's give the Lord an ovation of praise. Amen. This is an old hymn of the church. Uh, most of you know it. The song says victory in Jesus. And we're going to sing an old hymn of the church with just a little bit of a twist to it. But it's the same words. And so we're going to worship the Lord together. Let's worship together today.
of the Lord. This next song might be brand new to you, but it's really simple. It is just straight out of the Word of God. It just said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So if you've ever learned that scripture, you can sing this song. So let's worship together this evening. Well, I was glad when they said unto me, oh, I was go into the house of the Lord. We've had church this week, folks. God's been in the house. We've had the anointing on our pastors, and thank God for that, the ones that have preached, and what a blessing it's been. And uh, I am very thankful to be affiliated with all of these ministers in this community. 
Never, never found a better group of guys and ladies. We almost seem to leave her out a lot of times, but what a blessing. But tonight we've got a treat. We want um, Brother Tommy. I don't know where he's at. There he is. He's so big I can't hardly see him. <laughs> but he's going to come, and, and then this sister's going to come. Good evening, y'all. Thank you, Pastor Jack. Thank you for all of your uh, prayers, your heartfelt attendance. Um, Change Lives Ministry exists to uh, reach the lost and restore lives. And this community revival means a lot to me because it took me in as a son. The community. Without our prayers, we wouldn't be anywhere. Anywhere. So prayer. So to try to be a good respecter of John, Pastor Jonathan's time, I just wanted to say, um, some of y'all know my story, but I have something I, the Lord laid on my heart today. And um, if I can, I'd like to tell you that uh, I, I grew up in the Lord. I grew up in a Christian home, as Christian as you can get. Um, my dad had three sons, Tommy, Tim, and Troy. All three of us had the most awesome Christian foundation that you could have. And then all three of us went a different way than we were taught. We, uh, we went as far as you could go away from the Lord. So I had three brothers. My dad used to tell me, how it's so important. you got to take care of your brothers. You must take care of your brothers. And um, later in our, into our addictions, uh, my youngest brother and I were, were involved in some, uh, some pretty wicked things. And through my actions, his actions, um, I gave him enough drugs that he could take his life intentionally. My hand to his mouth. Thank God for CLM. I came up here. I learned what the true meaning of repentance was, is. In Genesis, God's speaking to Cain, and he says, uh, Cain, what have you done? Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? Cain says, my punishment is too great to bear. I'll be a restless wanderer until somebody kills me. But from the time of my involvement, what I did to my younger brother, I was sorry. Gosh, I was sorry. But I didn't repent. And so I wandered far from the Lord. Restless, vagabond, one translation says. I came up here. I learned from CLM what true repentance was. The men that came in to do, to do devotions, they taught me. They loved me. They guided me. And they prayed for me. I remember as I began to go all in for the Lord, I would always say, leading up to that, I would say, God, I want my brother back. Give him back. You're God. Show me that. And then one day, while I was living at Change Lives Ministries, I heard God's voice. And he said, you still got another brother. As well as I'm going to give you 10 new brothers every 13 weeks. So get to work. So I'm going to ask, if I can, um, Tim Turpin, can you come up here? And as he's making his way, this is Tim Turpin, my other brother, who got to see what a godly brother looks like. What we do at Change Lives Ministry is we love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And it's just not there for the people that come. 
Look at what, is, what has happened. This is kingdom dividends. As I introduce him, um, can I have Britt, Bethany? Bethany, are you here? And Tiffany. Can you all come up for a second? We are Change Lives Ministry men's program and lovely women's program. I'm not going to share their stories, but I definitely um, think this is important. Because in our community, we are hurting. People are dying. We can't do this without the community's help. We do not charge our men and women that come to our program for 13 weeks. It costs $652 per student. Your prayers are vital, as well as your support. So I want to introduce these two because we're doing kingdom work there. We love the Lord, and we do it because the love of him compels us to constrains us. So this is my little brother, <laughs> Tim Turpin. I thank y'all for your time. Uh, Good evening, Tommy's brother, Tim. Um, I'm excited to share a quick word for you. One of the things that I've learned this week at this revival is something that the pastors here have taught me, and uh, I've noticed they've looked at their watches and said, do you have a little time? So I just, I won't take much of it, but I do want to share a quick testimony a powerful testimony of what God has done in my life. Um, I'd like to read a passage um, very quickly from God's Word and then just share for a couple of minutes. I can tell you this, to get up in, fr uh, up in front of all these people um, used to make me very nervous. Um, but today I can tell you um, I'm not nervous at all because uh, Jesus Christ has done an amazing work in my life and I want to shout it from the mountaintops today. So I don't care what I look like anymore. This is Ephesians 2.1, and I'd like to share this testimony, and I want to start off with what my life was like before Christ. And you, he made alive, were dead in trespass and sins. That was me. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That was me. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. That was me fulfilling the desires of the flesh, that was me, and of the mind were by nature children of wrath, just as the others, that was me. And so I won't go into a detailed long uh, history, but 20 years of hardcore addiction, as bad as you can go. I was deceitful in all my ways, selfish and self-centered unto death, prideful, arrogant, and egotistical as they come. Um, we were raised in the church, I knew of God's word, but my knowledge of God's word far exceeded my obedience to it. I was a hypocrite, a Pharisee. I was. Um, a quick story I'll tell you to show you how far away I had gone from God, how totally depraved I was. As my father was on his deathbed, I went into the hospital to pretend to see him and stole his debit card. That's where I was at. Did it to my mother in the hospital at times before, too. Um, cared about no one but myself, truly. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So by his grace and mercy, he brought me to a little double-wide trailer in Monk's Corner, Changed Lives Ministries. Within 24 hours that I got there, I could feel the Spirit of God. About that 24 hours later, I was still so prideful and arrogant that I couldn't cry in front of men. Went onto the edge of that property, fell down on my knees, and God gave me a quick picture, a quick view of how I'd been living my life, and it was awful. And I fell on my knees, and I cried, and I sobbed, and I screamed out to God to save me. 
and I felt an impression upon my heart as I was crying and sobbing there at the edge of the property and he said my son I love you and I forgive you and he said my son I brought you here to do a work in you and then I want to do a work through you and so as I started to go through Change Lives Ministries and started memorizing scriptures, meditating on God's word, as the men, the pastors, the different men from the community started coming in and pouring into us, as we started to go to all the different church services and praising and worship God, I heard dry bones rattling, dry bones rattling, and God began to connect those bones in the right place. Those bones began to be covered with sinew and flesh, and then I was still dead man walking, blind man who couldn't completely see. But God breathed his breath of life into me. He removed my stony, stubborn heart and replaced it with a tender, responsive heart. And today I can tell you I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. And today I choose to comfort others with the same comfort that I've been given at Change Lives Ministries. Nobody charged me to come in there, and we don't have to charge anybody else. And that is only by the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So one of the things that we ask for besides your financial help is your prayers. Um, I've committed, our staff has committed our lives to these men. We're on the front lines. We know that we don't war against flesh and blood, but against spiritual principalities in the, in the heavenlies. So we need your help and your prayers to fight that battle on a daily basis because we love these men. The Lord has given us a heart for them. But at Change Lives Ministries, one of our biggest prayers is that the Lord would not just break the chains of addiction in the lives of these men, but just as importantly, he would chain these men to Christ and that these men would be healed there and raised up here. The word says... The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Our prayer is that the Lord would raise up workers. They'll heal men's hearts, create men to be uh, the godly um, husbands to their wives, the godly fathers to their children, the godly sons to their parents, and that he would raise men up to go out into the harvest to do his work. We pray that the Lord would make men that leave there pastors, Sunday school teachers, praise and worship leaders uh, that they would go out from us and start other ministries in other countries and, uh, and, and not just in our country but other countries and we know that by the power of Jesus Christ and what he can do we can't do it by the sweat of our brow but we can do it by the power of the spirit and we know that one day that will be fulfilled so we thank you for your support we thank you for your prayers thank you pleasure, thank you Tim, to introduce Tiffany and just a quick word about okay. y'all's uh, relationship and what's happened there. Okay, so my name is Tiffany. I'm the manager of the women's ministry and this is my sister Bethany and she is a resident at the Women's Transitional House. Story is very similar to Tommy and Tim's and you know, I've spent a lot of my life in addiction, running, and just ended up in all kind of trouble, prison, and just doing things with my body I had no business doing, and, you know, after that prison sentence, I said, I got to do something different with my life, and I had a mentor in my life through a prison ministry, and she told me about changed lives, and as soon as I heard it, uh, the name just spoke volumes to me, changed lives, and, you know, that's what I wanted, and I was in prayer and God just kept leading me to change lives so I came there and completed the program and I was asked to stay on his staff and you know during that 13 weeks in the program I had time to be still and to know that God and who he was I got to really learn more about him because actually when I was in prison I always studied the Bible but I didn't have anybody teaching it to me so when I got to change lives I had volunteers coming in, and I'll never forget this one lady. She said, um, you know, we got to learn about God and who he is because he never changes. And I was always reading the Bible and trying to, you know, see where I fit in. Like, how does this apply to me? What does this say about me? And it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And once I got to learn that, you know, drastic things started to happen in my life, and just surrounded with the community of believers. I see so many of you in here that come to Change Lives Ministries and pour into us. I see board member here, uh, co-workers, friends. I mean, and y'all are new family to us. And I remember when I came home, I had been away from my sister for five years. And when I came home, the very first time I seen her, I remember her falling out. She was high and you know I kept praying for her I kept trying to get her to come to change lives and she never would you know she just wasn't ready but 
probably about 15 weeks ago, she said, I'm ready. She came through the program. She graduated. She gave her life to Jesus two days after Christmas. <laughs> She decided to stay at the transition house. I mean, she said she fought tooth and nail, and I kept just praying. I was like, you know, I don't have any control over this, but God, I know you have control over it. So I just, you know, put it in his hands, and she's still there. She's here today, and it's just a blessing to know that, you know, God does restore so many things. He restores the years that the locusts have eaten. She's just standing right here with me, and I'm just so glad that, she's made that decision and I thank Change Lives Ministries for that and all that they do because without this ministry this wouldn't be possible so thank you guys for all of that we um, you know how much we love you and we see how much y'all love us to support and we need that and you know Jesus was speaking and says uh, I tell you all these things so you will have peace in me Jesus speaking peace in him you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer or take heart. I have overcome the world. In him, we have victory over addictions, over generational curses. Broken. Do you see it right in front of you? This is something that's tangible. You can touch it, but not in a creepy way. Um, you can see them. You can um, you, you, you see what, what, what the Lord is doing there. And I love my state of Florida, but I would never, ever, a million years, know I would come to love a state, a community, like I do right here in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Now I'd like to introduce Patty. Come on up. Patty, I was in church, freshly out of the program, and Patty was up at the front at Sandy Circle Community Church, and I was in the front row too, and, passed, and she came up to get prayer, and Pastor Dave, I was kind of like, what's she doing? And Pastor Dave said, pray with her. And I was like, what? Do what? So I got over my fear and I prayed with her. And then we've enjoyed a relationship ever since then. She's our first woman to go through our program. We love her very much. Ms. Patty. Whew. God laid this on my heart yesterday. And I'm not one to speak in public, but I called Pastor Chris this morning. And I said, I just... After what Tommy was said, I said, I really just have to speak because, not because I was the first to go in and the first to graduate. It's just to know where you've been and to not think that you can come to where you are. It, it's just amazing. I mean, Pastor Chris was talking about yesterday if you've been affected by Victory Baptist Church and I got saved in the Hannah House. I got baptized at Victory. I met my husband at Victory and I got married in Victory. And if you'd ask me tomorrow, I'll be three years sober. And if you'd ask me then, there's no way, there's no way that I would have ever thought, but your donations do mean everything. Um, just everything. Because they don't ask for anything of you other and I did not know anything about the Bible when I went in there. Didn't know what a chapter, a verse, uh, anything. And I was just like, this is not going to work. Because I tried to start it and read it like a book. And I was like, oh, this is so confusing. What am I going to do? And through the women that come in and, and the devotions that we have and just the pouring out from the community, it was amazing. And it made me want to start feeling like I could live as a normal person again. And I just thank God for all that and all of you. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. And these are the ones that, that you get to see. There's so many, many, many others that you never see. There's a, there's a host of people that's in our community that are hurting. And they're hurting not only from addictions, broken homes, and broken marriages, children are being abused, and we could go on and on. So these are some that you see that we can help, and to God be the glory. And tonight we're going to receive, right now in just a few moments, 
And I'm going to ask Brother Tommy to come and his brother, if he'll come. I want them to take up this offering this, this afternoon. And we, We've already done fair. But we need to do some more. Amen. And what we're doing here is not to be seen. It's not to get any glory. Our glory is when we see people that are being healed in addictions. So with that being said, let's pray together. Almighty God, we're so thankful today. God, for the privilege that you've given to us. God, that we can come together. Lord, that we can love you and praise you for all that you do. God, we're thankful for this ministry, Change Life Ministry. God, we're thankful for every man and every woman that's ever came through the door. We pray, oh God, for the staff, and Lord, that you'll bless them and keep them as they work so hard, God, to help those to get to where they are. And Father, we'll love you. We'll praise you. Bless the, the ones that have and those that don't. And Father, we'll love you and praise you for all that you do. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand all over the house tonight. Let's just go back to worship just for a few minutes. This next song I might be new to some of you. It may not be. It's an old Randy Phillips song. It's a really simple chorus. Um, but as you've listened all week, you've heard various men get up and so eloquently proclaim the gospel. You know, where this is the last night, and as I was praying, and I said, Lord, give me the list for, for our worship team on, on the last night. This song immediately came to my head because this song literally just simply says, it says, this is your house. When we leave this place, some of you may come back on Sunday to Oak Grove. Some of you may go to Courtsville First Baptist or Calvary or Santee Circle or maybe a church that's not mentioned. But you're just going to a building on Sunday. That's all you're going to. In fact, right now, all it is is just you know, a building right now because you're here. It doesn't matter if we were in the parking lot. The Bible says my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
So tonight we're going to proclaim that this, me, Lord, I surrender to you tonight. This is your house. And will you come and dwell? So let's sing it together. This is your house. Father, come and dwell. This is your house. It's a holy house of prayer. Where the lost and the lonely, they bring their burdens and their cares. This is your house, Lord, this, this is, is your house, come and let's sing it again, Lord, this, this is your house, Lord, Father, come and do it, oh, this, this is your house, Lord, it's a holy house of prayer, where the lost and the lonely They'll bring their burdens and their cares. This is your house. This is your house. Come and dwell. We dedicate this temple to the Lord. We dedicate this temple. Oh, what 
you fell in love Jesus and I've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow there have been times I did know right from wrong but in every situation God gave me blessed consolation that my trials only come to make me strong so together we do it all, do it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Faces. There have been times I felt so all alone. But in those lonely hours, yes, those precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know that I was one of His own. So we sing through it all. For all those valleys, I thank you for storms you brought me through. You know why? Because if I've never had the problem, Lord, I would know that you could solve them. I would know what my faith in God could do. So together we're singing through it all. the 
devil. Devil, I thank God for all those mountains, but I also thank him for every valley. I thank him for every storm, Lord, you brought me through. You know why? Because if I never had that problem, Lord, I would know that you could solve them. I would know what my faith in God could do. So together we're singing through it all. That's all he's done for us this week. Come on, if you're going to praise the Lord, praise the Lord for a minute. Now, my, my question before we get started tonight is this. Are you thanking God for the mountains? Do you thank God for all those valleys? Do you thank him for every storm he brought you through? Because I'm going to speak here. I, I never went through changed lives ministry, but I can tell you I had a life that was changed by Jesus. Because if I never had the problem, I would know my God could solve them. I would know what faith in God could do. So now I can sing through it all. Let's sing it together. Through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all. Through it all. Through it all. I've learned to depend upon His word. Oh, let's sing it one more time. We're singing. Through it all. Yes, we sing together. Through In Jesus, I've learned to trust. I've learned to trust in God. Oh, it's through it all, through it all, oh, through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon His word. I've learned to depend, Lord. I've learned to depend upon His word, but Lord, I've learned to depend. I've learned. To depend upon his word. Now my question is, are you ready for the word? Amen. Are you ready for the word? You may be seated for a moment in the presence of the Lord. We'll go to the book of Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. They can go ahead and put those scriptures on the screen in case you guys need to follow along. Now I don't know... I heard a bunch of people get up here and say they're thankful for the ministerial alliance and all of these things. The jury is still out on me because they put me last. So I don't know how I feel about that. 
Brother Chris Brambro did a, such a good job on Sunday night. Fantastic. I'm glad he got it out the way before he got sick, and we're so sorry he's not with us tonight. We really wanted him to be here with us. Then Pastor Doug's like, well, I'm going to take it to the next level. Pastor Chris came last night, and here's the only problem. You know what? You, you know, anybody baseball fans, anybody baseball fans besides the preacher? When you got a lead in the ninth inning, you bring in a guy called the closer. His job is don't let them score anymore. Stop them right where they are. I know we technically are ending in meetings tonight. Now, revival doesn't end when we walk out the, walk out the church. In fact, I sometimes struggle when I preach because the, the word revive, you, you can't revive something that's never lived. So when we're having revival... Sinners come up, but, but we're, they're meaning salvation. That's evangelism. Revival is for the rest of you folk who don't think you've got a problem, but you do. Because we're trying to revive something that's been alive before, but ain't been there in a while. Hello? And so I thought about that today as I was riding around and praying and seeking the Lord. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't even know what to begin. These guys have done such an eloquent job. Conveying the word of the Lord. I was like, man, I'm Church of God, so I'm probably the most Pentecostal out of all of them. That's probably why they put me last, so if I scare you, you go home and you don't have to see me for a whole other half of the year. <laughs> In fact, I don't know if that's good or bad, because I'll be the last guy you hear until the next revival. I don't know if that's good or bad. We'll see on the first night in the fall <laughs> which ones. But uh, I was praying, and I said, Lord, this is just I'm just going to be honest with you. I know Pastor Chris... Uh, Pigler says he's uh, Baptocostal, so for all you folks that are Baptocostal, you'll understand. But uh, I was hoping the Holy Spirit would move so I didn't have to preach. That'd be great. I was fine with that. I was like, Lord, have your way. Let him come up. Let him just feel Jesus. It can be a sweet, sweet spirit. It can be a Jericho march. I don't care what it is. As long as I don't have to talk, it's great. He didn't do that. I don't know if God and I need to talk a little bit more next week. I don't know how this goes, but uh, I, I come to you humbled. More than anything else. Uh, Pastor Doug and them were preaching the other night about David and some of those guys were talking about he was ruddy in appearance and things like that and he was the runt. <laughs> That's me <laughs> in the group. <laughs> Pastor Chris is the shortest, but I'm the runt. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm also the baby. And I don't, I don't apologize for that. I like being the baby. I'm, I'm 32 and I am proud of it because that means everybody else is older than me. I like that. And I get preferential treatment at times. Uh, Unless Pastor Jack's in the meeting, then it goes out the window. <laughs> he makes me work for it. But as I began to read, this is a scripture you're going to think, now this preacher has lost his mind. We in revival. We ain't in Christmas. I know we're not at Christmas. I know. I like to celebrate Christmas all year round. If it was me, if it was left up to me, I'd leave tr my Christmas tree up and just decorate it for the seasons. I don't have to take it down every time. But... I just can't. My OCD kicks in, and I don't like it sitting there that long. The Bible says, if you'll stand for the reading of the Word, we're going to start in Luke chapter 1. We're going to read a little bit. See, I, I'm one of those preachers. You know, some preachers read like one or two verses, and then they'll try to expound on the rest of it. Why well, expound on something he already wrote? I just let him talk. So I just read his for a while because he already wrote it, so I don't need to tell you what he said. I'll just let you read it with me, what he said. So we're going to read for a little bit, and uh, you're going you're gonna to see where we're headed. Verse number 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, day a certain priest by the name of Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughter of Aaron or of the tribe of Levi, and her name was Elizabeth. They both were righteous before God. Not one or the other, both of them. They were righteous before God in walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while they were serving as priests before the order of the Lord of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, that his lot fell to burn incense, he went to the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of people was praying outside of the house the hour of incense. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar. Don't miss which side of the altar he's on. He's not on the left, he's on the right side. Don't forget which side he's on. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear came upon him. And the angel of the Lord said, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer has been heard. Anybody ever prayed a prayer, and they're just wishing that God would hear it sometimes? You've been praying for a long time, but you're just waiting for him to finally hear it. He said, Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and will rejoice many 
and rejoice in his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will neither drink wine nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, talking about Jesus, and the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's us. We've got to get ready. Zechariah said in the angel, yeah, yeah, you kidding about this, right? That's a joke. I'm like 80 years old. I ain't having no baby at 80 years old. I'm supposed to be a grandfather by now. I am an old man and my wife, Zacharias was a smart man. He didn't call her old. He said he was old. <laughs> he said, I'm an old man. He just said, but my wife is just well stricken. That's a politically correct way of saying she's old too. He just didn't, he just didn't want to say that. He said, so she is well advanced or well stricken. The angel of the Lord said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and who speaks to you and brings these glad tidings. Behold, you'll be mute and not be able to speak until the things take place because you did not believe the words which fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled and lingered that he took so long in the temple. And he came out, he could not speak to them, for they perceived that he had seen a vision, for he beckoned to them, but he remained speechless. Sometimes when you get in the presence of the Lord, you don't know what to say. You just have to sit there. You're speechless. And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he parted to his own house. And after many days, Elizabeth conceived, she hid herself for five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me. In the days when he looked upon me, and he took away the approach among the people. Let's drop down to verse 57 there, guys, in the back. Now, Elizabeth, basically when it came time, verse 50, excuse me, verse 59, I'm sorry. I, I got ahead of you there, guys. So 59, and on the eighth day, when they came to circumcise the child, they wanted to call him by the name of his father, Zacharias. But the mother said, not so. Y'all don't understand because when God gives you a word, it's a not so moment. You don't change what he says. He said it. You let it go. Not so, but the child's going to be named John. But they said unto her, there's nobody in your family. No kindred, nobody. And your relatives called by that. So they was like, she must have lost her mind. So they go to Zacharias. They ask him, what is this baby's name going to be? What are you going to call him? He asked for a writing tablet and he wrote, his name will be John. So they marveled, and immediately his mouth opened, and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, praising God. For the next few moments, I'm going to preach to you on this subject title. Don't let your cousins name your baby. <laughs> Don't let your cousins name your baby. I'm going to ask Pastor Jack if he would so kindly to pray over the reading of God's word today. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. Don't let your cousins name your baby. This is an interesting story in the Bible. I might as well go ahead and take my watch off because it means nothing to me. It's just for decorations. So let's see what time it is. It says it's 8 o'clock. Oh, we'll be out of here by 1030. We'll be all right. We got time. I'm just kidding. It's the first century and the news is bleak. You see, from Malachi's prophetic pamphlet to the beginning of Matthew's writings, a lot has changed in time. There's only one page in between your modern Bible from Malachi to Matthew, but over 400 years of silence has taken place. Nobody's heard a divine word from God in over 400 years. It's a sad day when the world can't even hear a word, but it's even a worse day when the church ain't heard a word from God. 400 years. Since it's been spoken. You see what, what makes that so big of a deal? Because prophets are not prophesying. Hello preachers. Right. Heaven is silent. Yet history is slowly continuing to move on. There's no joyous and jubilant celebrations. But rather this is a season of dark and depressing times. The close of the old covenant is now coming to fruition because the new covenant is getting ready to be instituted. The Jewish nation is being enslaved 
into religiosity and living under the tyrannical rule of a guy by the name of Herod. The church is trying to be snubbed out in the darkness of the hour. Hello, preacher. Anybody recently been paying attention to the news? The church is trying to be silenced out in the darkness of the hour. Hello. Tyrannical rules are taking place all over the world and they're trying to stop what thus saith the word of the Lord. The problem is while all this is going on, my fear is has the church went silent again? We have nothing to say. Preachers aren't preaching the word. They're, they're giving you a good motivational pep talk. Hello. They're patting you on the back, sending you on your way, and telling you God's going to be good to you, but they're not telling you how to change your life. Hello. Well, y'all, y'all really quiet on me. I'm, y'all better than this. I know y'all. Y'all go to church with me. What's wrong with y'all? It's going to be a long night. We keep going like this. Where's, where's my change life, man? I told y'all at the Bible study, if y'all don't help, it's a long day. I told y'all, what's wrong with y'all? The first thing I want you to see tonight is there's a big problem. There's a big problem on our hands. That problem's name is Herod. In fact, the days are dark. Luke writes, in the days of Herod, the reason he writes that is because he wants to infer, you got to remember Luke wasn't presently there at the time, but Luke wanted to bring back to remembrance everybody else would remember what days were like when Herod was in charge. Can I tell you, we're going to get to a point, whether it's 2022, 2023, or 2025, when masks are not going to be needed, but you're going to always remember the day that COVID-19 changed your world. You'll never forget it. See, the problem is Herod is in control. So Luke writes this as if they know Herod was an evil man. He was the most maniacal and vile creature that you could ever imagine. He was so envious and engrossed with pursuit of power. History tells us that he even tortured and killed his own children because he didn't want them to come up and try to lead an insurrection against him. But there's a dichotomy here you've got to understand. That even in the darkest of days, while the days are silent, while the night seems to linger, God is still up to something. Amen. Come on, somebody. Act like you've been to church once before in your life. The days can be dark. The world can try to silence you out, but while we sit in silence, let me let you know, I don't know what's going on in Washington, D.C. tonight. I don't even really know what's going on in Monk's Corner tonight, but I can tell you what I do know in Macedonia tonight, that while God, while the world is doing their own thing, God is still up to something. God is still up to something. You see, in this story, we find faithful people who feel like failures. We find holy people with a hopeless heart. We find committed people but feel like they're being conquered by the enemy. We find faithful people but they're not walking in the favor of the Lord. Anybody ever been in those shoes before? You've been faithful but you feel like God's a million miles away. You've tried to live right but your heart is hopeless. You've tried to be committed to God and come to church and go to Bible study and yet you feel like the enemy keeps beating you down. Hello? I'm reminded, I'm not going to take it for time's sake because the men of God already have said it this week, but I'm reminded of that story in 1 Kings chapter 19 of the prophet Elijah. Probably in chapter 18, he goes to Mount Carmel and he, he, uh, he comes up with the greatest pyrotechnic show of all time. That, that is pretty cool. When you don't even have to synchronize the fire to get it to come down, that's pretty cool. Like nobody knows when the fire is going to shoot down, but when it came down, everybody knew it happened. But by the time, one chapter later, Jezebel, the old wicked queen, has got enough of this dude, this Holy Ghost-filled preacher named Elijah. She puts out a warrant for his death. I mean, she puts out a hit on him. Now, you've got to understand, Elijah eventually said to the Lord, Lord, I'm the only one on Mount Carmel. I'm the only one, the only one. Woe is me. One ch- he's just called fire down from heaven, and he's literally just killed 850 prophets of the enemy. And yet, just the very next day, One day after his greatest breakthrough, one day after his biggest miracle. Lord, I'm the only one left again, just me. Boy, ain't that like the enemy? As soon as you have a breakthrough, he just takes it right back from you. We sing a song at our church. I don't know if any of you have sung it before, but it's one of my favorite songs. It said, I went to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he stole from me. Because he's under my feet. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. I'm not going to let the devil take what God already told me is mine. I'm going to walk right back into his camp, take it back and say thank you for playing, but I'm going to take what's mine rightfully back. Thank you very much. He 
he sits there. And in verse 15 through 18, he's telling God all his woes. Woe is me. Now I'm going to use, you know, I read out of the King James Version. That's the KJV Version. My initials are JKV, so I'm a little dyslexic, so I switch the translation sometimes. So I'm going to preach to you for a minute out of that JKV Version. Here's what God said to him. He said, quit whining and complaining and being a crybaby. Quit sitting around like you've got no hope. I'm with you. you. What do you mean you've got no hope? I coined the phrase to our church for over the last year. I've said it so much that I'm sure they probably are tired. I even had signs made. We coined the phrase hope. We coined the phrase, the acronym hope. Hold on. Pandemics end. Hold on. Problems end. Hold on. God's promises are eternal. You only got to hold on a little bit longer because God's got hope for each and every one of you. And the reality of it is he sits there and what he doesn't realize is God says, Buddy, there are over 7,000 other people that didn't bow yesterday at Mount Carmel. Because what you don't understand tonight, church, is your decisions. You may not ever realize and you might be woe as me, but your one decision might affect a large group of people you never thought you would have affected. That one time you got saved might save thousands of others through your coming to know Jesus Christ. That changed lives ministries when you went through the program and God changed your life. Now you're going to change the world for Jesus Christ. One thing changes it all. See, we're living in a day where panic, bewilderment, perplexity, disorientations, confusion reigns in a pandemic and a worldwide plague right now. They tell you, well, you shouldn't still meet in big groups. Well, you shouldn't still do this. Listen, I am as safe and protocol savvy as the rest of them. I, I, may, I tell my church people every Sunday that if they are a dollar, they have to go home because that's a fever. they got to go home. If they, that screen, when I shoot them with that little barcode, that thermometer, and it says one zero zero, you ain't worth a dollar. You, if you're less than a dollar, you can stay. If you're over a dollar, you go home. We don't have rich people in my church. We all poor there. A dollar or more, you go home. We're 99 cents or less. Hello. But I'm also not going to live in fear because God did not give me the spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. I'm not saying don't mask. I'm not saying don't be, make protocol. But I'm not going to stay at home either because if I can go to Cracker Barrel, I can go to church. Come Hello. On. Come on, somebody. Let me, let, me just, let me just help you with something. Let me just go ahead and go on my pastoral soapbox because nobody. I'm the last guy, so there ain't really nothing you can do about it. Because you don't, if you don't come back tomorrow night, neither am I. So it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> if you can go eat at Cracker Barrel and you can go to, to out to eat and you can go bowling and you can go to Frankie's Fun Park and you can go do that, you ain't got no excuse why you can't come to church because there's a whole lot more people not protecting themselves there. Come on, somebody. Even in dark days, helpless days, days of no hope, silent days, can I tell you, even when all hope seems lost, there's still a God. And I came by to remind you tonight, He's still on the throne. But COVID-19 did not catch Him by surprise. The election did not catch Him by surprise. I don't care who sits in the White House at Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm not staying here long enough to worry about it because my God still sits on the throne. Hello. That was the introduction. Let's keep going. <laughs> secondly, secondly, there is an element of purity found in this story. God's looking for a pure people. God's not... <laughs> here I go in my soapbox again. I've heard people say, Lord, I just want you to bless my mess. Well, God doesn't want to bless messes. He wants to move messes. That's right. God doesn't want to bless your sin. He wants to remove your sin, eradicate your sin. He's like, oh, Lord, I want you to, just, Lord, you're just going to bless my mess. How about you get out your mess so God can bless you? Hello. Yeah. God didn't let the prodigal son in the story stay in the pig pen. Sometimes you've got to get up for yourself, get up out the slop and quagmire of life, go yeah. back to the father's house and say, I screwed up, Lord, help me. Yeah. Get up out the pen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody's throwing in the towel. Everybody's like, oh, Harry's in control. Oh, man. Well, how many of us have heard even good church people in the midst of the day we're living in? Yeah. Well, pastor, I would come to church, but i got to be real careful. Because my doctor said, uh, could you ask that doctor about going out to eat too? Because I just saw you Saturday night. Hello. 
Well, Pastor, I got to eat. That's what they make DoorDash for. Drop it off at the door. Yeah. Hello. See, everybody, even in the day and hour we're living in, everybody's saying, well, you know. But I'm telling you that even if everybody turns their back on the Lord, God's going to still have a remnant when this is all yeah. said and done. Whether you want to be a part of it or not, it's between you and the good Lord, but he's going to have a remnant when this is all said and done. On, you see, the days are dark, but there's two people with pureness of heart. Zacharias, Elizabeth. You notice, I love this story because Zacharias was so faithful to continue to do what he was called to do even when he wasn't getting validation from the Lord. Hello. Some people only going to work for God as long as they're getting credit from God or from the church. Hello. But the day I stopped giving out plaques, the day I stopped telling them every year about getting them an appreciation dinner or a gift certificate to Logan's because I'm appreciating them. There's nothing wrong with appreciating. Just understand what I'm going though. Because some people, they're only in it for what they're going to get out of it. But the day I stopped giving up my free stuff, they decided that they don't want to do the job anymore. Sometimes God still needs us to do the job whether or not we're getting validation or not. God called us to do a job, so do it and do it unto the Lord, not unto man. Hello? There's no Rima word. There's no specific spirit breathe, spirit life ordained word. Nobody's heard it in 400 years. But he's still going to church. Hello. Well, pastor, I can't go to the church anymore. Why? My pastor, I, I go to church every week and they don't sing the songs I like. Okay. You like hymns? No. Okay. So you like contemporary music? Well, not really, not all of it. Okay. You like Southern gospel music? Well, it depends on the song. So which genre do you like? Well, it just depends on my mood. Well, we didn't get a mood ring to find out what day you or week you're in. <laughs> Hello. Well, I go to church for the word. Yeah. But that pastor, he just preaches so hard. All right. So you want him to be a little more loving and have a little more decorum. Yes. Two weeks later, I'm not going to a church where the pastor don't preach on sin. <laughs> so is that another one of those I'm supposed to call you on Saturday night and find out if I'm supposed to preach heaven sweet or hell hot this week on you? Hello. <laughs> See, too many people are trying to find their niche, but Zacharias is just doing what he was called to do. Amen. He just did what he was called to do. But he had remained faithful. Can I tell you tonight, and you hear this preacher well, even faithful people can find themselves in seasons of brokenness and barrenness. Just because you get saved doesn't mean life gets easy. In fact, it just gets harder because a kingdom divided amongst itself cannot stand. If the devil's already got you, he really don't have to work so hard to keep you. Hello? But if I give myself over to Jesus, now he's got to work overtime to try to get me back on his side. So when, you know how I know when I'm doing right? When everything goes wrong. Because I know the devil's on my back that week. But when I'm going two, three, four, five, six, seven months and I've never went through an obstacle, never went through a mountain or a valley experience, I'm I should start thinking, huh? The devil must not be afraid of me right now. Might need to do some spiritual checkup from the neck up and figure out what's going on. Hello? Amen. See, the reality of it is, just because I get saved doesn't keep me from problems. Sometimes it just exasperates the problem even the more. God is still looking today for an upright, a pure, a holy spotless and undefiled people. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us, we're talking about purity, the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 and 27 that Jesus is coming back for a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. He doesn't want a stained church. No. Well, Pastor, you're trying to say that, that, that uh, you know, that, that uh, I have to have a perfect life? No, but when Jesus saves you, he changes that life. So I might have a black heart, but God does something science can't explain. It's a black heart, but somehow Jesus takes red blood, and when he mixes those two get together, somehow it comes out white as snow. It's very, uh, very, it's actually impossible to take red and black and mix it together and get white, but God can do that. So no, I'm not going to heaven with my sin and Jesus too. Hello. The Bible said that if I'm lukewarm, God gets a little nauseous. The, the, the Bible doesn't say, well, God feels a little queasy. <laughs> no. 
One translation says he will spew you out. That's like spit. That's pretty nasty. Right. I mean, how many of you ever just want to get spit on or spit on? Anybody? Yeah, I don't think so. You don't like that. One translation, though, actually says it will make God vomit. That's pretty graphic. That's like where it's coming from the bowels and it's, it's projectile type stuff. That's bad stuff. You see, the Bible says God doesn't want me to have my sin and him too. He says pick one or the other. I'd rather you just be a, a really good sinner than a half sinner, half saint. I mean, listen to what God's saying. I'd rather you be really good at sinning than trying to fool the preacher that you're good, but you're out there sinning too. I didn't say this was, I didn't say it was going to be a fun sermon. I just said it was going to be a sermon. I didn't tell you it was going to be a good one. But I also want to present to you tonight, thirdly, the panic that's in the midst. There's a panic going on. Because everybody knows Herod's a vile man. But that's not the panic that's going on, Brother Allen. Zechariah and his wife can't have a child. And they've got past the age where that's supposedly possible. They've gotten to the point that it used to be that Elizabeth was just, her infertility was the problem. But now there's two problems. Not only is she still experiencing infertility, now she's old and barren. She's not got one problem anymore. She's got two problems. Anybody just want to shame the devil and tell the truth? You ever felt like that when you came out of one, when you had one problem, it just seemed like another one came up before you could even get out the first one? Hello? Like if you had no, if you'd had no bad luck, you'd have no luck at all kind of thing. Just one thing after another. You see, Elizabeth, you got to catch this. Elizabeth has been barren for years. But God never called her barren. She did. Let that just marinate. I like a steak that sits overnight and marinate because it soaks up into the thing. So I'm going to take about five seconds and say it one more time and then let you just sit on it. God did not call her barren. She did. The reality of it is, oftentimes in our lives, we self-impose things God never said. We identify it, but God never said it. Elizabeth inferred she was barren because she wasn't holding a baby. God never said that. She did. There's no sin ever mentioned. Rachel, Hannah, Naomi, all these different ones, they, they never had a sin sickened problem, but pandemics and things happened and they, they lost their children and they, they lost the ability to have children and they went through bad stuff. God didn't say it was their problem. In fact, in fact, if you study it out, Rachel, who took a long time to finally get a baby, it's actually her bloodline that Jesus comes out of. God might take a little time on your time clock, but delay does not mean denial. It might take him a little bit longer than you wanted, but he'll get to the end game at some point. See, Zacharias knew that children were a blessing from God, the fruitfulness of the womb. They were a sign of blessing on one's life. They would often have parties and celebrate life with children. They'd have big festivals and they'd celebrate the joy of babies. But with no child, the rumor mill picked up. Now I know none of y'all... Have you ever met people who like to talk very much? I know none of y'all have rumor mill people. I know all y'all, everybody that's here, every pastor that's here, every church representative, I know that nobody in your church ever talked behind closed doors to somebody. They're all perfect people. It's just mine, me, that has that problem. But see, everybody else is talking behind the scenes. What's up with Zacharias and Elizabeth? What, what? Is, you think Zacharias has been sinning? You think Elizabeth? Who, who's, what's the reason for her not to have a baby? Because in the Jewish culture, if you couldn't have a baby, they often attributed to it as a sin problem. Again, God didn't say it, but people put a label. Sin. That's the reason you can't have a baby. God didn't say it. But the reality of it is while they're all talking and questioning, they don't understand what God's doing. So let me caution you very quickly that don't equate barrenness and brokenness to abandonment. Just because right now you're going through a season of being broken 
Or maybe right now you feel like you're barren spiritually. Don't equate that that God abandoned you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, he said. See, oftentimes the potter breaks it because it's not the right way he wanted it. But Jeremiah said when I stood there and I was watching him, he broke it because it just didn't look right. But when he put it back together and he put it back on and he started fasting, when it was done, it was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. God takes broken things and broken people and makes beautiful things out of it. In fact, we always say it as a coin phrase, God makes all things beautiful in his time. A broken and a contrite heart or spirit, God will not despise. God does, just because you're broken don't mean God threw in the towel. You might have, but he didn't. Hello. Bitterness, though, she's good. Sister Bitter is good. She got skills that nobody saw coming. Because after a while, that barrenness and that brokenness allows Sister Bitterness to come inside. I'm not mad at God, I'm mad at the church, I'm mad at the preacher. Every, we're not even talking about anything, but do we want ham or fried chicken for homecoming and she's leaving the church over it? It's not because she's got a mammal problem or a bird problem. It's got, she's got a heart problem. Hello. We argue and back, backbite and, and grumble and complain over stupid stuff. Stupid stuff. We'll split a whole church right down the middle to decide if the carpet's going to be green or red. What the world? How about just don't put no carpet in at all? We're all happy. Who cares? Amen. Well, pastor, if you did that, if you had a Holy Ghost service, somebody fell out. Again, catch them. Don't let them hit the floor. We don't want a lawsuit. But I don't care what color it is. It can be neon green for all I care. I'm not here for the carpet. We argue over dumb stuff. Sister Bitterness will creep in and she'll start. You sure you heard from the Lord? You sure that's what God said? You gonna still go to that church? You gonna still sing on that praise team? Sister Bitterness will just get in there and she'll start trying to cross problems. See what happens is when we get in a state of panic, now I want you to, to not throw the tomatoes at the preacher. I'm just telling you what I feel like the Lord said. But some people, when they get into a mode of panic, they make irrational decisions because they're panicking. You ever, anybody ever had to call 911 for anything? Well, you start freaking out. You know what they always try to do? Remain calm. Just remain calm. Talk me through it, just remain calm. Because they know if you're panicking, something's going to get lost in translation. We need you to remain calm. The, the 911 dispatcher, in fact, Sister Ashley is back here. I know she works back there. I've never had to call them and have her do that, which is fantastic. Uh, and, and, and maybe she's really quiet, but maybe, maybe she's different on 911's call. I don't know. But I've never heard anybody when they call 911, you know, when they, the phone rings, I've never heard, what do you want from us? <laughs> I, think I'm, I, th- I think I'm good now. I'm just going to lay here and die. I'm good. Thank you. No, they don't panic. You can tell them anything, but they have been trained. Don't let it ruffle you. Try to stay calm. Now, they might take the headset off as soon as they get off the phone and have a breakdown, but while they're on the phone, their job is to try to keep you calm. Panic, panic will drive your decisions, but don't let it because panic will put you in predicaments that you never thought you'd find yourself in. For example, COVID. Oh my gosh, it's COVID! Grab a mask, grab your wife, grab your kids, grab your donkey, run! What? We've lost our minds. You say, Pastor, I shouldn't, I shouldn't wear the mask. No, but look at the predicaments we're in. Nobody thought we'd wear a mask all the time. We're pan- we, it's, it's a byproduct of panic. Online church, we're trying to do what's right, but that's because the world was in panic. Nobody was coming anyway. Hello. Even before, even before COVID-19, you didn't come, so it's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, God. Just had to get that off my chest so I could preach better. We've got people that are now glorified, uncertified homeschool teachers, and they didn't even want to teach school. Hello, parents. We panicked. We panicked. 
Yes, I'm all about, you know, people need, if they're, people are getting the vaccines and all I, But you know what's amazed to me? Two years ago, I could walk into Walgreens and I had to leave my right kidney as a down payment just for them to call me when Tamiflu got back on the shelf. Now, they're begging me to take it off the shelf because nobody's got the flu. <laughs> See, you say, well, Pastor, you're making fun of COVID. No, I'm not. I'm telling you, we've all, we've, bubonic plague, flus, COVID. There's always been a problem that is, and panic that has been in the world. Right. The world is living in a sin sickened state. There's always panic. Yeah. But we as the people of God don't have to panic because we know the guy who's in control. Why should I worry? Why should I fret? God's never failed me yet. I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry. Well, now we're going to get real for a minute. So they're all panicking. They don't know what to do. Zacharias is like, we're old. We can't have babies. Adoption's pretty much out of the equation. I, I creak and crack and all kinds of stuff just getting out to bed. I sure don't want to go outside and play baseball. I'm just trying to get that AARP check in the mail so I can go to Hardy's and get a coffee for $1.50. I don't really care at this point about children. I want free coffee. <laughs> Hello, all those are over 55. That was your moment to say amen. That was your moment. It's free coffee. <laughs> free coffee. I need an IV every Monday after church for that stuff to get me through the day. You get it for free. Here's what happens. The angel of the Lord says, Zacharias, I've heard your prayer. God's heard it. You don't have to panic. Don't freak out. Now, Zacharias was church of God, because I want all y'all to get a break for a while and preach on me. Zacharias was a church of God man, because he can never take anything at face value. He's always got to have an opinion. God forbid he was church of God. Always. Because God's messenger, I mean, we ain't talking about the preacher. I mean, God sent one straight out of the clouds. Yeah. I'm, I mean, hello, anybody know what an angel is? I'm the only one here ever seen, you know, yeah. heard about the angels. You know, they live up there. I'm not talking about Cupid. I'm talking about angels, like real ones. He comes down from heaven, and you know what the church of God spirit-filled preacher said? <laughs> yeah, right, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> I knew he was church of God. You can tell anybody at a church of God service, you can tell them, oh, God said, and they'd be like, yeah, I bet that's going to happen, preacher. Yeah. I know a PH church don't do that, and Baptists, y'all don't do that. Only church of God people doubt everything. It's just, just us. So he leads to a protest. He protests, number four, what's going on? He says to the angel, uh, yeah, see, about this plan you got, that ain't going to work for me. I'm old, and my wife, well, she's not as young as she used to be. <laughs> the old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be. I mean, so we got a little problem here, God. So unless you're going to do some kind of miracle, this ain't going to work for me. He protests. Now, you have to understand something. The first person to hear a word from the Lord after 400 years is a senior citizen. That means all y'all that are seniors, y'all better live it up for Jesus right now because y'all get the news first. Yeah. I just want y'all to know that. In fact, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm jealous of all you old people. I really am. Because if God should tarry, you're going to get there before me, and I don't like that. You're going to see Jesus quicker than I am. I'm kind of jealous of that. I'm ready to go now. If he blew the trumpet right now, I'd be like, deuces, y'all out. I'm out. Go. <laughs> See, the reality is the first person that heard a divine word from the Lord was someone who was doing his job faithfully yeah. and someone who had been seasoned to know you don't let what's going on around you affect what's going on inside of you. Yeah. So you have to understand this, and I'm going to quickly share this with you. In the time period that we see this, you've got to understand the, uh, the order of the Levitical priesthood. This is crazy stuff how God, the Bible says the steps of a good man or woman are ordered of the Lord. You have to understand God don't make mistakes. It's not like God just randomly throws stuff in the air and hopes that it works. 
God has a plan from the foundations of time. For I have plans for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and an expectancy. God's always got a plan. Amen. Now, we might try to go off the plan, but God's still got a plan. I mean, y'all remember old Lazarus? Jesus, come. He's dying. Jesus is like, yeah, I'm going to stay here three more days and have fried chicken. I'll be back next week. <laughs> Why wasn't Jesus freaking out? Because Jesus didn't care if he died or not. He knew he was going to get him up, so it really didn't matter. Jesus wasn't afraid. Jesus knew what he was going to do. Jesus already had a plan. Yeah. The world's freaking out. Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? Jesus like, sit down and watch. Just watch. Quit freaking out. You know COVID-19, you know one person that it's not caught off guard? God. That's right. God didn't get caught off guard by it. Hey, I don't care if it came from China, India, Ethiopia, or it came out your backyard. I don't care where it came from. God didn't get caught off guard. No. Not at all. And so he goes, and you know the story. He resurrects Lazarus. Everybody's like, Jesus, if you'd have been here. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. Tell him to hold off from the repast. We're not having dinner today. This is not a funeral. It's not home-going celebration. This is a resurrection, so we're not going to need food. Thank you. You know the story. He resurrects him. But you've got to understand this order of the Levitical priesthood. At this particular time, there are 24,000, not hundreds, y'all, 24,000 priests selected to serve according to the Old Testament accounts and breakdowns of the duties. If you count how many were supposed to come at the different lines, Zacharias means he's one out of 24,000 jokers. And it just so happens that it's his turn after 400 years of nobody. I mean, you know what I mean? For 400 years, other preachers have went in there and done this job. Somebody's went in there and been praying. Somebody has lit the incense. Somebody's been going. But after 400 years, one out of 24,000 odds goes to church that day to burn incense. You see, they would draw lots. The odds of somebody drawing one out of 24,000 for achievement, the odds were so low that many Jewish historians say that most priests never got the opportunity of a lifetime to go light the incense because they would be dead before their lot would come up. What he's saying is there was going to be men and women that were going to die and not ever got to walk into the presence of the Lord. They're going to walk and be, they're going to be on the outside. They're going to be right at the threshold. They're going to be right at the altar. They're going to be close to breakthrough. But they're going to be gone before they get it. They're not going to be in the presence of the Lord. Zacharias is not lucky. He's divinely orchestrated by the Lord. The steps of the good man. Remember what he said? He was blameless. The steps of the good man. God said, no, I got a word I need to get out. But I need you to be the one to do it, Zacharias. I need you to come on to church this Sunday. I've heard people say this. And I want you to hear this, Pastor, very carefully. Pastor, I've been praying for my breakthrough. I've been praying for my miracle. And then they stop coming to church. What if the lots were drawn in heaven and this Sunday, Palm Sunday weekend, your turn was on the chopping block in heaven. But you don't come to church, so they have to draw another lottery ticket because you didn't come and claim your prize. Hello. Because the reality is, sometimes I think we miss our moments because we don't go to the place where the moments happen. Oh, it's all well and good to say, oh, I need a miracle. We just don't go to church and look for the miracle. I'm not saying there's a short distance in prayer. No, I can pray for you at the house, but I also know that the Bible tells me don't forsake the assembling of yourself as in the manner of some, but come together in exhortation. Come together. So he goes and he is in this situation. You got to understand this angel, though. Like, See, when we talk about angels, we think like little chubby cheek, little plump, smooth bottoms, fluttering around on little three-quarter inch wings, fluttering. They're not flying, they're like fluttering. Have little, little arrows and bows, and they're so cute, and they're just wearing like white cloud, soft, like, you know, little underwear-looking things, and they're just up there flying around like little innocent creatures. That is not the guy that showed up. That's great if that's what you think an angel looks like. But I want to paint to you a picture for a moment, if I don't mind. Brother Jack, will you stand right here on this, this corner of the step? I mean, you won't have to stand but very long. Actually, I, I, let's go to that side because it's the right side for me. I, I know it's left side to y'all, but I'm going to do it because it's my right. And just face the audience. Zacharias comes in to pray that day. You would think 
If you walk into a room that you have been in there for a couple days already and nobody else has been in the room, that if you walk in here the next time and somebody's in the room, you notice. I don't know about you, but I can't really hate on Zacharias too much. Because if I walk out of my bedroom into another room and I come back in my room and my four-year-old's in the room all of a sudden, like seat of Chucky, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to Chuck Norris him right across the room unintentionally because I, I don't know who he is. He coming in my room like that. Just showing up, crawling out from under the bed and I didn't even know he was in there. Don't play with me. You walk into a room, nothing's happening. You walk in, bam, there's somebody in there. It'll freak you out. Yeah, we've been scared of your own shadow. Come on, tell the, shame the devil and tell the truth. You walk around the corner, you jump, and it's yourself. It's yourself. See, Gabriel wasn't some little runt just sitting here going, I'm waiting for you. Gabriel's a bad dude. Gabriel is known. Gabriel's not just a, a an angel. He's not just like, oh, God, there's something there hanging out. I mean, this joker is known throughout the whole Bible. This joker has an important job. He's one of the best of the best. I mean, he, God, you ever notice God only sends his best? Send a son, best. He sends the best angel. He didn't send a no-name angel. He sent an angel that said, by the way, my name's Gabriel. How are you? He identifies himself like, I don't know if you ever heard of me, but like I'm a pretty bad dude. <laughs> Gabriel, I love the response. See, Zacharias like, you know, there's no way. There's no way that I can have a baby. There's no way my wife can have a baby. This is not going to happen. And Gabriel, I love Gabriel's response. You know, you, you just, Gabriel has a lot of my tendencies. He is smart aleck to a certain degree. And he just kind of, he just kind of says what he thinks. He's like, who, who are you talking to, bro? But that's my version again. That's not the King James. That's my version. He's like, who are you talking to? Do you not know who I am? See, we got too many Christian folk walking around with their heads bowed low and hanging down like they've lost everything and they got no friends and all their hope is lost. And God's sitting up in heaven going, what are you, what are you doing? Do you not know who I am? Amen. You say you're a child of me. Do you not know who I am? Amen. The angel says, bro, let me help you with something. Let's go on a little history lesson because obviously you've been forgetting to read your Bible this week. My name is Gabriel. Now, now, now don't miss what he says. He just doesn't say, by the way, my name is Gabriel. It is so nice to meet you. No, that is not what it says. It says in verse 19, I am Gabriel. Now he tells you who he is. Who stands, not even has to kneel. This joker don't have to bow in the presence of the Lord. He gets the opportunity to stand. The Bible said that the 24 elders, and when we go to heaven, we got to bow and present our crowns to Jesus. Gabriel's so bad, that joker don't even have to bow in the presence. He said, I am Gabriel, and I stand before the presence and the throne of God. That's the man talking to you today. Can I tell you today, you just don't have somebody speaking on your behalf. You've got God, the host of heaven, that is protecting you and watching you. You are God's child, not nobody else's. You're God's. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But here's what happens. Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. I stand before God. I'm not just some random dude. I want you to understand. I want to ask you this question before we get ready to final, finish up this message. What do you do when your prayers outlast your faith? Think about what I just said. The Bible says when I pray, they're stored up like vials up in heaven. What do you do when you pray and you pray and you pray and then, Brother Dale, you just give up? But your prayers are still stored, so your prayers are outliving the faith that you had that they could come to pass. What do you do then? Because Zechariah had quit praying by now for the baby. He had been to so many church conferences. He's been to so many revival services. He's been through so many prayer lines. He's had so many anointed gloves. He's done it all. He's tried. They've went to every doctor. They've went to every treatment. They've done it all, and nothing's happened. So he just gave up. He's done. But can I tell you that even when you give up, God doesn't give up on you. Amen. Even when you pray it and you're like, you know what, I just forget it. It's just not meant to be. God's sitting up in heaven going, just wait. Because you might have forgotten about it. You might have forgotten you prayed over it. You might have forgot what you were needing, but God did not forget. Because not one tear has fallen he didn't catch. Not one prayer has been prayed he did not hear. He's got them all right where he needs them to be. Hello? 
He says, what do you expect me to do? Now, I love this. Zacharias goes back and he's like, well, how do you expect me to believe this? I mean, there's no way. <laughs> Gabriel's like, okay, so apparently you're a little slow to the draw, so let's try a different approach. I just told you my name's Gabriel. I told you I stand before the Lord. I told you, like, I stand. Like, do you not hear the words that are coming from my mouth? I stand before the Lord. And you still have the audacity to say, oh, that ain't going to work for me. That's not going to happen. So Gabriel says, let me help you understand this. So this is how you're going to know this is going to work. You won't be talking no more for a while. I'm going to shut you up. In fact, you're going to be shut up for nine months. You won't be able to talk for nine months. That is a long, I know some of you men prayed that before, that prayer. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I know some of y'all prayed that when y'all were using those mops for Pastor Chris. <laughs> y'all are praying, Lord, if you can use anything, Lord. <laughs> but I want you to understand, nine months you can't talk. Some of y'all would lose your mind. Some of y'all couldn't even last two weeks quarantined in a house. Most of us couldn't talk for nine months. <laughs> Woo! Just felt the Lord in that real quick. Sorry, it just came on me. He is silent for nine months. I, be, I asked the Lord when I was praying about this. I said, Lord, I know there's got to be a reason. I mean, come on. You could have done anything. You could have made the man, like, blind. You could have made the guy, like, you know, I don't know, have some kind of crazy signal. Why, why, why the mouth? I mean, why not, not the man talk? Maybe a day, two days, three days. Why nine months? Why would you keep him shut up from being able to talk for nine months? And here's what. I'm not saying I've heard divine revelation all the time, but I really do believe this is what the Lord said to me. I believe what Gabriel was really saying is this. Rather than you allowing your mouth to doubt and to curse your own future, I'd rather put a mute spirit on you so that the thing that used to be your strength as a preacher now will be your weakness to the world. So instead of letting you curse what I'm trying to bless, I'll just shut you up so you can't curse what I'm trying to bless. Hello. Because the strength of the preacher is being able to talk. It's kind of hard to go to church and your pastor does sign language. <laughs> Pastor's up there. <laughs> like, what are we doing, the hokey pokey in church? What are we doing? He can't talk. You, now, I don't know if Elizabeth was excited about that or not, but you've got to understand what Gabriel was doing is he was taking away his ability to speak death over what God was trying to bring life into. Can I tell you, as we get ready to close this revival and this community event, can I tell you, some of you have walked in places, the Lord has promised you things, the Lord has spoken over your life. Some of you came up on Monday and Sunday and Tuesday and you, you've had breakthrough in moments, and, but the devil's going to come and try to tell you nothing happened. Can I tell you, you better be careful what you say because God will shut you up if he has to. You better speak life. Blessing and cursing cannot come out of the same mouth as not me. You better know what you're saying. You better know what you're saying. Now, Brother Doug had no way in China to know what I'd be preaching on this week. The man sitting in the back back there, I can't remember his name, and I apologize, but he was up here praying last night. Now, none of y'all, y'all probably all thought, man, pastor's over there, he's sacrilegious, he won't even go and pray with people. No. See, God sometimes allows me to be an observer. Because I, can, he, I don't know how, I can't explain it to you, but he allows me to just sit and see things. Now, all of y'all were praying, 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 but Brother Doug was standing right here. That man, gentleman was standing right about here, right after he had got, got touched by the Lord. Pastor Doug sat right here, and he said, say it. He told him to keep talking, say it. Claim it, say it. You know why sometimes God wants us to keep saying things? Because it needs, it's not because God didn't know what he was doing. We need to re keep building our faith to know God's doing what he said he's doing. So if, God, some, if we're going to speak things that aren't what God wants, sometimes he'll just take that right out of the equation so that he can do what he wants to do. Hello? So the unbelief will poison your speech. Can I tell you, some people, they just talk too much. They just talk too much. Zacharias should have just stopped when it said, hey, I'm Gabriel. That was enough. Shut up. Don't do nothing else. Hello? He stands before the Lord. Are you dumb? Quit talking. But it's like, right here, I, he, Zachari again, Zacharias is the church of God. He has to get the last word in. Even God can't get the last word. Zacharias has to do it. He's like, but, 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 but. don't say but one more time. But, 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 but. And so Zachariah, so that the Lord did get the last word, he said, all right, let me just shut you down so I can tell you what's going to happen. See, he 
tells them this. It's interesting to me that while Zacharias is in the presence of the Lord, the people of God were on the outside praying. Can I tell you that it's something good always happens when the people of God can be praying even when the preacher's not in the house? All you old Grovians in here? Pastor Chris is not here. He's next door. He is meditating and resting before the Lord. He is not feeling well. But can I tell you that does not stop God? In fact, something good can happen even when the preachers are not in the house. Amen. You don't need me to come to your house every week. Sometimes you and Jesus can just have a little talk with Jesus and make it right right then. You don't need me every week. But when the church stops praying, now you listen to me carefully as Sister Carol begins to make her way. When the church stops praying, pandemonium ensues. We took prayer out of schools. We took Ten Commandments off the courthouse walls. We tried to do everything but take in God we trust off a of currency. We tried to make ourselves as far of a Christian nation as we possibly can come to be. And yet we wonder why pandemonium is going on in the world with different political agendas and movements, and riots and unrest. Why? Well, I can tell you why. We told God to step back and he did. God's a gentleman. We said, God, we need you to kind of back up for a minute. Give us our space. And God said, okay. And now you got what you asked for. Israel wanted a king. They got Saul. They didn't what they wanted after they found out about it, but they wanted it at first. Then all of a sudden they're like, wait, wait, wait. That's not what we meant. God's like, too late. That's what you asked for. See, the problem is we sometimes ask God to do something and he does it. But you can't get mad when God does what you asked him to do if you don't like the results. God, please, please don't mess up our perfect little country, our perfect little world. We don't, we don't want to do this. We don't want to do that. Take the prayer out. Take the tongue. But don't do that. So God said, okay. He stepped back. Now everybody's like, Pastor, our world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, because we asked God to step back. Now, if we want it to get better, maybe we should ask him to come back. Amen. Hello. Amen. Because here's the last thing tonight. After all this happened, there's a verse 57. There's a promise. Now, a promise is something that I told you that I would do. You don't see it yet, but I make good on my word. In the first part of Luke chapter 1, the Bible said you're going to have a son, Zacharias, and you're going to name him John. But verse 57 and following, he has a baby. But that joker still can't tell I mean, he can't even talk. He can't even express his bundle of joy moment. He, he can't say nothing. All the family and friends come over. They're celebrating. Oh, they're having a baby. Oh, my gosh, it's a baby. They're having baby showers and got all their little, you know, little danishes and all that kind of stuff. They do a baby shower. I don't go to them very often because I don't, I, I'm not able to have a baby, so I don't go to them. So, but whatever y'all do at baby showers. They're all excited. They're all great. Everybody's having a good old time. And somebody breaks the silence. He's eight days old in Jewish culture. The number eight in biblical numerology, I like numbers, uh, the, like biblical numbers. The number eight means a sign of new beginnings. Seven days, God completes it. That's why six days he, he, he worked, seventh day he rested, eighth day, new day. It's a sign of new beginnings. So in the purification process, a baby had to be considered unclean or ceremonially out of commission for seven days. But after the circumcision on the eighth day, do you understand that blood, uh, that, that circumcision is a blood covenant? So that means when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, this 400 years of silence we were talking about a while ago, a blood covenant just allowed me to start a new beginning. Because all the things I used to do, the promise is coming down. The old song says, the dusty road, uh, that blood covenant did it on Calvary for me so I didn't have to. So what happened was, the eighth day comes, it's a new day, and they say, What's the name of the baby? Some of them started naming the baby. Go back and read it. That's why I said don't let your cousins name your baby. It ain't their baby. They don't understand what you've been through to carry it. So stop letting people tell you what they think you should be doing or who you should be because they've never walked where you've walked. Why are you going to let somebody else name your promise when you were the one that had to carry the promise? They didn't have to go through the morning sickness. They didn't have to go through the sleepless nights. They didn't go through the travail of labor. They can't appreciate the baby because they weren't the one carrying the baby. 
But we'll let him speak over it. He oh, we're going to call him Zacharias. She's like, no, he's going to be named John. No, no, nobody in your family's named John. You see, names, names are very important in the Bible because the identity of a child was determined by the father. Go back and read it in Scripture. The father would always pass the blessing to his children. He gave them identity, purpose. In fact, science tells us that the gender, the sex of a baby is determined by the father. The father plays a role. Names confer identity. That's not Jack Todd. That's Bill Mitchell. That's his identity. That's who he is. But that is not Dale Mitchum. That's Jack Todd. His name confirms his identity. You see, Rachel, when she had her baby after Joseph, she had a baby and she was about to die. And she said, I'm going to name him Ben Onai. That means the son of my sorrow. I wish I wouldn't have had you, kid. Think about that. Having you is going to take my very life. I wish I wouldn't have done it. Some of y'all sitting on the sound of my voice, you've had family, friends, co-workers, parents, wives, husbands, siblings that have said things just like that. I wish I didn't even have you. But Jacob was a man of God. He said, I'm not going to let my son live down something that he was never intended to be called. He said, you're not going to be called ben Onai, son of sorrow. You're going to be called Benjamin, which means the son of the right hand. Now, real quick before I finish. Does anybody remember where Gabriel was standing? Because in, throughout Jewish history, the right hand was the confirmation of the blessing. It, it, it brought about, it, it signified strength, power, authority. It was the right hand they would place on the child. That's why Jacob said when Joseph came and he brought his two sons, he, he had his right hand on the oldest and, 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 and Jacob said, no, no, that's not right. So he switched them and he put the right hand on the youngest and Joseph said, no, daddy, that's not the oldest. And he said, I'm telling you, I got to do it because the right hand, the younger will serve the older. It's the right hand, the conference. The Bible says that we have a mediator between God and man. He died on Calvary's cross. He teleported from here to glory. You know where he sits? Right hand. Power, authority, right hand. Right hand. But I want you to understand something. I said names confer identity. You hear this preacher very carefully and I'm done. Some people need to stop answering to names they were never designed to be called by. Because some of you in here have been walking in an identity God never called you, you conferred it on yourself. Just like I said to you, Elizabeth said she was barren because she couldn't hold a baby. God didn't say that. That was Elizabeth's decision. Some of you say, well, Pastor, I'm a drunk. No, you might, you might be a drunk in terms of what you do, but that ain't what God called you. God called you a child of God. He said, I'm even married to the backslider. You can screw up and I'm still yours. Well, Pastor, I'm a sinner. No. That's what you're conferring on yourself. But if you come to the altar of repentance, God says you'll be a prince and a princess to the portals of glory. You're a child of God. Amen. Some of us have been living off of names we never were designed to be called by. We keep answering the names. You know, Pastor Tommy and I have been, the last couple weeks we went and ate lunch together. If I walked in here tonight and I was like, hey, Pastor Tommy, and Brother Doug turned around, that's the wrong person. He is identifying with somebody who he's not. It's a counterfeit. I mean, brother, they don't even look the same. One has more hair than the other. It's pretty, I mean, they don't even look the same. That's right. It's wisdom. But the reality of it is, the same thing is the way it is spiritual. There are some of you today, as we get ready to dismiss, you know that John's name literally means God is gracious? That's what John means. God shall in favor or God is gracious. So you know what, when Zacharias tells all those people that he's naming him John, you know what he's really saying? God's been good. God's been gracious to me. I didn't deserve a baby. I couldn't have even, in my own ability, had a baby at this age. But God's been good. Brother Dale, talked about it the other night. I told him he had potentially cancer. That's scary. That's real scary. He 
they came out of the operating room and he finally came to a sober knowledge of what was going on and they say well the problem is uh, we can't find it oh, well, that's because God's been gracious God's been good yes. when you walk some of you guys that were uh, that, that came and shared your testimony with brother Tommy's ministry you were living in a bad situation Tim but the reality of it is when God found you God was gracious because the grace of God can cover a multitude of sins. That's what we're saying. Either we believe it or we don't believe it. It says grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch. That's pretty graphic. Wretch like me. Some of us have been answering to names we were never intended to be called. So I just want to simply tell you this as we get ready to pray. Why are you letting your cousins try to name your baby? Why are you letting people call you things God never said you were? Why are you identifying in something that God never identified you as? We like to say, that right now, you know the biggest thing going on in the world right now is an identity crisis. Hello? Can't decide if I'm a boy or a girl. Can't decide if I'm a male or female. Can't decide. That's an identity crisis. Can I tell you tonight, if you sat under this pastor for even five minutes, can I tell you if you got nothing else today, nobody can appreciate what you went through to carry the promises God has for you and your family and your life. So stop letting other people confer identities on you God himself never called you to be. You can say, well, Pastor, I, I, I was a drunk. The key word was was. All these people that came through changed lives, if you notice, they all used past tense verbs. I was a drug addict. That means I'm not now because God's been gracious. I was a drunk. But I'm not now, because God's been gracious. I was a sinner. As says, uh, Jonathan Edwards said, I was a sinner in the hands of an angry God. But God was gracious. Can I tell you, no matter what you're going through right now, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know what John ended up doing? He became one of the greatest men in the New Testament. He prepared the way of the Lord. Go back and read what the angel said in his promise. He said, your child, Zacharias, is going to go before the Son of God. He's going to stand. He's going to be the foreshadowing. He's going to go tell everybody and prepare their hearts for Christ's coming. Can I tell you, it's, it's not funny, it's comical. Actually, I just thought of it driving in today. Do you know where the name Jonathan comes from, the derivative? It comes from the surname John. John, Jonathan. So God sent me by here to tell you tonight, God is still gracious. And he's still good. And I'm here to prepare the way of the Lord. You don't need to see me tonight. I'm nothing special. You've heard plenty of messages this week. I just want to take you back to the old rugged cross. I just want to take you back to Calvary. I just want to tell you, hey, God's still in the miracle working business. And whatever your promise is, don't let other people call you by names you weren't meant to be called. Don't let your cousin name your baby. Will you stand all over this house with me tonight? Put your heads are bowed and eyes closed as we get ready to sing a song of worship. I want to know if there's a need in this house, whether it's a lost loved one, maybe you're unsaved and want to come to know the Lord. I always like to give people the opportunity to come to meet Jesus. But I know you've heard the clarion call many times this week, and they've already made that profession of faith. But maybe somebody's in here tonight, and you're still having to live down your past. You're still living down names of things people used to call you and self-identifying in things that you used to be. But I want to tell you today, you don't have to leave here still carrying that same identity. You don't have to have an identity crisis. God called you a child of His. I want you to come tonight and I want to pray with you. If you have a need, you say, Pastor, I, this word was for me. I need to hear from you. I need a word from the Lord. I need to, God's been silent for so many years. I need to hear from Him one more time. I want you to come. Really quick, we're not going to procrastinate long because I know the, the hour is getting away and many of you need to get home. But if you've heard God call you, you're still trying to live down the negativity. You're still trying to live down the hurt. You're still trying to live down the frustration. You're still trying to live it down. You come. Don't you go walk out of this place still carrying that. God bless you, my friend. Are there any others? Don't you leave this place carrying that identity crisis. God is still a gracious God. Will you come as they sing? Let's sing it. You are Alpha and Omega. For you are Will, if they'll come.
come and help us pray. There's some folks here today trying to not live down their, live the past that they've had. You are Would you just stretch your hands and help us pray? And obey God. Let's sing it together. believe we've heard from God this week it's not about no big eyes and no little use it's not about a denomination but it's about Jesus Christ and him crucified and it's in the books and already what's been done this week there's some come back to the Lord there's some accepted Christ there's some just been just come and just got blessed and I don't know about you but I've been blessed I said I've been blessed and God is so good to us better to us than we are to him amen if you're not afraid I want you to turn and just hug somebody different than your companion trying to be seen but I had a, a gentleman ask me the other night and I just haven't forgotten it and if you'll just bear with me just a m couple of more minutes while the ministers are going to the to the door I've got to sing the old ship of Zion now, I don't know if uh, 
Brother Dennis Shuler is watching tonight. I know they've been watching some of this. But I want him to know this is also for him. Amen. If you'd like to be seated, you can. Or stand. I was standing on the banks of the river Looking out over life's trouble scene When I saw an old ship that was sailing Is that the old ship of Zion I see Its hull was bent and bound From the storms of life I could see Waves were rough, but that old ship was steady Sailing out the stern of the ship was the captain. I could hear as he called out my name. Get on board. It's the old Zion. It will never pass this way again. As I step on board, I'll be leaving all my trust. days it ain't gonna be long we're going home turn around and love somebody would you amen consider yourselves dismissed